Thanks for taking a minute to tune into a fresh word with your click. I hope this is uh, life-giving and encouraging to you as much as it is to me. Listen to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. Fear not, you worm, Jacob. You men of Israel, I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. God says through Isaiah the prophet to disobedient Israel, fear not, you worm, Jacob. <laughs> Don't be afraid of worm theology. It is in fact absolutely necessary for the gospel to be enjoyed and loved and treasured for all it's worth in your life. Because it's to worms that God says, I am the one who helps you, O men of Israel, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. That's Isaiah 41, 14. And it's a thematic verse for really the whole Bible. You see, when when sin enters the world, not only are we accursed and given over and bound to death, the wages of sin is death. Not only do we inherit the sinful nature by being born in the likeness of Adam, but we live in an ever uh, needful state of being redeemed, of being saved, not just out of the guilt of certain acts or the guilt of failing to do good acts, but out of a sin nature, out of a deep core being, not just a doing, but a being of sin. There's no such thing as a person born innocent and then they only become sinful later in life. No, we are all conceived sinful from our mother's womb, David says in Psalm 51. This calls us worms. That, that is, we're of the ground. We're of the ground and we're powerless and helpless to change our nature from a worm into a worshiper, from a worm into a worthy man and woman for Christ. That transformation happens in one way and one way alone, and that is by the power of the new birth that comes through the receiving of Jesus Christ. The new birth, the work of the Holy Spirit in us to open our eyes and ears and hearts to love and trust Jesus Christ is the new birth. It's called being saved or redeemed in the biblical vocabulary. There's a man I mentioned in this last Lord's Day message named William Carey. He lived in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. He was a missionary to India, most famously, but he was also a cobbler. He built and rebuilt secondhand shoes as a young man. He was saved at age 17. Uh, he was married at age 20 uh, to Dorothy. Uh, he was very, very poor in England in the late 1700s, but he heard the gospel and he even was became a pastor to two small churches in England. And as he proclaimed the gospel, he sensed a profound desire within his heart to go to the ends of the earth and to pr present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the peoples of the earth who had the least likely possibility of hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So he left England he formed a missionary society and agency to help support him. There's such helpful wisdom in William Carey doing this. He helped um, form a missionary agency and left out to serve the cause of Christ in a place called India, a place where England at that time had begun to form a political relationship with the people of India. You might remember the East India Bay Company and uh William Carey saw that as a wonderful opportunity to bring the gospel of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to India. And he, in fact, ultimately did so. He um, translated fully the word of God, the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, into six Indian languages and partially par parts of the Bible into 24 more Indian languages. He helped to profoundly establish a Christian school there and to establish Christian churches for the preaching of the gospel and to lead Indians out of darkness and out of Hinduism into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Many in our day, especially in our day, but certainly in his day, certainly in other times of world history, 
they look upon someone like William Carey as a oppressor, as an enemy. Like he's erasing the Indian culture and replacing it with a British culture, much like the East India Bay Company did. And he's just lumped in with them. They were out to make money. He was out to make disciples. But he's often wrongly accused of being a uh, oppressor, uh, an imperialist, a colonialist, someone who just wants to take over, erase what he or she deems as a blind, um, backward culture, Hinduism, India, and replace it with his culture, British uh, sophistication, British values, British government, British culture, British recipes, British God. That's not what William Carey did. That's an unfair accusation against most of the history of Christian missions. It's certainly an unfair accusation against William Carey. He's not a colonialist. He's not an imperialist. He didn't just bring for the sake of greed or power the British culture and try to foist it upon the Indians. No, in fact, what he sought to do, according to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, and many other passages of Scripture, Old and New Testament, he sought to bring the Hindus with their Hindu ethnic identity out of darkness and into light, out of blindness and into seeing, out of death and into life, out of the kingdoms of this world and its domain of darkness into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and give them this joyful message of the gospel so that they could sing the praises and the excellencies of him who redeemed them into marvelous light. William Carey is not open to the accusation of being a greedy or power-hungry imperialist. He is not. The East India Bay Company is open to that charge, and many others in the history of the world are open to that charge, but not godly, genuine, biblically faithful missionaries like William Carey. Now, he's not a perfect man. He's far from a perfect man. There are serious questions in the minds of almost all good biographers and historians as to how he cared for and ministered to his wife, Dorothy. He did not treat her with the respect that the Bible commands godly men to care for their wives. He failed in that area. They went through great sorrows and they experienced great consequences of poor decision-making. William Carey cannot be idolized. He cannot be elevated as a example in all ways. He has to be looked at carefully and biblically, and he has to be weighed according to the standard of godliness in Christ Jesus, as we find in Scripture. There are things about his life that cannot be imitated, and there are things about his life that are to be imitated because they accord so well with Christ himself. William Carey brought the gospel and... Uh, Christian um, publishing, Christian tract publishing, Bible publishing, uh, Christian book publishing to Hindu India. He also brought a pharmacy and improved medical practices, even to the point of ending a evil tradition of called sati, which is the practice of when, an, when a warrior was killed in some battle the Hindus engaged in, the, the thought, the pagan and mistaken thought was that his wife should also be killed immediately murdered so that her spirit could be with her dead warrior husband's spirit. That was an evil practice. The wanton killing of grieving wives based on false teaching and error and lies. William Carey brought an end to that. In large part, many others helped, but he was instrumental in bringing an end to that horrible practice. Can anybody step back in all seriousness and say, that was a mistake on William Carey's part? And that Sati should have been allowed to continue? Of course not. Ridiculous. William Carey looked to the group that sent out missionaries before him that I mentioned in my sermon on Sunday called the Moravians. That's why I'm thinking about this with you. I'm thinking about the Moravians and their massive effect on William Carey. And William Carey often thought of as the father of modern missions. Well, that's an overstatement, really. But in fact, he was influenced by the Moravians, and then he in turn influenced many others. Uh, and many others after him have been faithful in their own way, in their own nation, in their own time, and in their own setting. 
the cause of Christ will always be global in its proportions and therefore missions will always define faithful churches. It's not just an appendage of the church. It's who we are. It's who we are. The very nature of the gospel calls forth the missionary enterprise. It's who God is. He sent his son as the first supreme, highest, and best of all missionaries to come to earth, to be incarnated as a infant, an embryo in Mary's womb, and to grow, be born, and live a life of perfect righteousness, and to uh, be killed on the cross brutally in crucifixion for the guilt of the sin of all who trust in him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and for the granting of righteousness by faith, his righteousness, to all who receive his redemption by faith. Jesus Christ, the glorious one, the great missionary, not only the model of missions, but the maker of missions by his very death and resurrection on the cross. To my right, you can't read it. I can see on my little iPhone that you can't read what's on this framed a uh, piece of fabric to my right, but I want you to know that a donor gave this to the church uh, graciously and generously because this person took a piece of fabric, a piece of a piece of cotton, and with charcoal, it looks like, or some kind of um, substance, did a rubbing on the gravestone of William Carey, which exists in a place called Serampore, India. The rubbing reveals the lettering and the writing on William Carey's gravestone. Here's what it says. William Carey, DD, Doctor of Divinity. That's the degree he had. Born 17 August, 1761. Died 9 June, 1834. Then under that it says, Wretched, poor, and helpless worm. An echo of Isaiah 41:14. On thy kind arms I fall. On thy kind arms I fall. May that be not only William Carey's testimony, but mine and yours. Don't be afraid to be called a worm. William Carey called himself a worm. The Bible calls us worms. I like worm theology because it's the Lord and his kind arms and his unfailing mercy and his stunning help, and his saving grace, and his boundless redemption, which scoops up worms and transforms us into worshipers and worthy men and women who love and live according to the gospel of his son, the great worm redeemer. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you so much for the salvation we enjoy in Jesus Christ. Don't let us ever lose our wonder for being transformed worms into worshipers and worthy ones to join you in your heaven with all the nations and all those who've gone before and all those who will come after who are saved by this stunning, breathtaking, scandalous, shocking grace that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Lord, so much for this framed piece of fabric reminding us of William Carey's life and ministry, broken as he was, and yet useful in your hands as a redeemed worm. Help us not to export to the world our propensities for pride or blindness or selfishness. Help us to put away sins of laziness or gossip lust or covetousness, greed, anger, anything that grieves you and undermines your gospel. Help us to, to be uh, disabused and revealed of those sins so that they might be repented of and cleansed from our lives and they no longer cloud or confuse the beauty and the clarity of Christ and him crucified. Lord, thank you so much for William Carey, not just for the excellent life that you enabled him to lead, but even for his brokenness. Let it be both a, a cheering on of our obedience and a warning against disobedience. God, we love you and we thank you that in Christ, you are constantly causing us to grow in the grace and knowledge of him. Thank you for the privilege many of us have had to go out for the sake of the name. Thank you for the privilege 
many of us will have to go out for the sake of the name. Remove all pride in us, if we have or shall. And thank you for the privilege many of us, all of us have, to send, support, pray for, give, go visit, and encourage those who've gone out for the sake of the name. Thank you that it's not just becoming a an appendage at the Faith Family at the Landing, but a, a, a defining feature of our DNA, a part of our very ethos. Do all the more, Lord, in this generation and in the next generation to raise up William Carey's in men and women who will go out for the sake of the name and spend their lives in such a glorious cause, the greatest of all causes. I ask this in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Thanks for a minute to listen to my little talk about William Carey and reflection on Isaiah 41. God bless you. Uh, looking forward to worshiping the Lord with you this Lord's Day. Remember that Sunday school's at nine and then Pastor Duncan Ross is preaching. We will enjoy the Lord's Supper. We will then have this coming Sunday night, a special baptismal service here at the landing with some singing and a baptism and the word of God, of course. So come and participate, join in, pray for, celebrate the great blessings God is doing to a broken and a needy people like us. God bless you. Take care. We'll see you soon.